Shalom and greetings friends. At the time of this video recording, we have recently just passed a very special annual appointed time of the year. Now according to our Creator, it's very special to Him. And this is important to know whether you're Jewish, whether you're Christian, whether you're of any religious faith or even non-faith or don't have any faith. Well, when we really look at it, everybody's got a faith, right? Even if you're an atheist, it takes a lot of faith to believe that there is not a creator of this universe. And when you just look at science and the law of biogenesis, you know, the, there's so many laws in effect to prove that there is an intelligent design, there's an intelligent creator behind it all. And so, regardless of your faith, this message is is important to at least understand and to know while there is time to understand and know it. And I may not express it perfectly and I may have little bloopers and, and mistakes in my speaking, but I appreciate your patience and any learning, any inspiration that can be offered and given to you freely here, I am just honored to do so. Now this time of year is often referred to in Orthodox Judaism as Rosh Hashanah. Now in Hebrew that simply means head of the year or new year. But we know in scripture it's actually the first day of the seventh month. It's not really a new year. It's kind of at the end and closing of an agricultural year as we get close to the fall and winter. But it's not really a new year and there, it's very ambiguous when uh, that name and title became overriding this special annual Shabbat and appointed time of the year, but it's more accurately and more specifically referred to as Yom Teruah or Yom Teruah. And in Hebrew that means day, Yom means day, Teruah literally means shouting. And his holy days are to be rejoicing, as we see in the scriptures, rejoicing. So shouting not in anger or fear, but in rejoicing, like, yay, yahoo, yay, all right. Any way you want to shout, any way you want to yell, but it's often referred to as the day of trumpets, or a feast of trumpets, because trumpets is... In ancient times, a trumpet could blast a sound over a long distance better than pretty much anything else. We have modern technology today, but a trumpet, or they would use a, this is a shofar, is taken from an animal's horn. We have a couple here in my props, a little ram's horn here, and a big one right here, right from Jerusalem, the Holy Land. And so, it's often referred to as the Feast of Trumpets, or Day of Trumpets. But Yom Teruah means shouting. It, it, shouting and, and uh, trumpets were used as announcing, also as a warning. Warning of war, of being attacked, but also of assembly and gathering together. So we have a big one here. I'll just give a little demo in case you never heard one blow before. <laughs> That was uh, a blow, and there's many ways of blows, many traditional ways of blowing the shofar, a lot better blowers out there than myself, but uh, you can go to the website shofar show great, <laughs> and uh, you'll see Robert out there. So anyway, much better blowers out there, but it's a day of blowing, it doesn't mean you have to be a great blower or a shouter or anything but just to be excited. What does this day mean? What is there to be excited about? What is so exciting about this day? Has it been just a day that's been nailed to some crucifixion, done away with, only for the Jewish people only? Well, we're going to look at this from not just from the uh, older Hebrew writings, but also what many of you refer to as the New Testament. 
plenty of scriptures in there. So please bear with me. Um, even in Isaiah 58, it says, Lift up your voice like a shofar. So our voices like a trumpet. You know, and, and so we see the comparison even in scriptures of shouting, trumpets, our voice can be like a trumpet. And uh, trumpets and shofars are always blown on, on this annual. It's a one time a year annual holy day. And I, there's seven of them all together. I have a video teaching on the chronological plan of salvation that our Creator has for all humanity. All humanity, starting with that Passover lamb and without that Pesach, you know, those seven annual holy days cannot offer a plan of salvation for anybody. So, you know, that's inaugurated every year with a Pesach. And so now we're, you know, Yom Teruah is the fourth annual Shabbat. And the next one coming, next one is Yom Kippur, as we say in Hebrew, Day of Atonement. But that'll be probably a next message for me, uh, according to His will and inspiration. But let's continue on here. These appointed times were prophesied, predestined, for, ordained over 2,000 years before the Israeli people. Now, you may have never heard that, but it's right there in Genesis, as we say in Hebrew, Bereshit, chapter 1, in verse 14, it says, And he made these two great lights, one to rule the day, one to rule the night, and the stars also, and they are to be for days. How do we determine a day? By this going down of the sun. Okay, not the middle of the night or darkness, but the going down of the sun. That's an object, a sign, as it says. They're signs, they're beacons, they're flags, they're, they're things you can see with your own eyes in the firmament. So we see days, the word seasons. We, we can determine the years by the lights in the firmaments as well, the equinoxes, and uh, so forth. But seasons that hebrew word in english isn't really summer winter spring or fall but seasons moedim is the plural for his appointed times his sacred assemblies his feast days look it up in uh, the strong's concordance let's see here i have the number here even written in the margin for Moedim's, it's uh, Strong's number 4150. That's 4150. Uh, check up on yourself. The different synonymous interpretations. His appointed times, his feast days were preordained. And of course, he shares them with his firstborn son. Wouldn't you want to share inheritance with your firstborn? And also with uh, the children that come after the firstborn? Well, obviously, yeah, Israel is called the firstborn son in Exodus chapter 4, in verse 22, the first nation. Of course, there were faithful men and women before Israel, like Abraham, and Noah, and Enoch, and so we see, uh, you know, our Creator had children before that, but as far as a nation, Israel was the very first, uh, that our Creator said, okay, this is my nation, my son, my people, and everybody needs to be grafted in to Israel, as we also read in Romans chapter 11. The wild branches from the wild tree, the Gentiles need to leave their Gentile trees and get back to, and be grafted into the holy tree of Israel. Now, it doesn't just mean Jewish. Jews, Judah is one of those 12 tribes. Benjamin joined Judah and a number of the Levites, but there's ten tribes of Israel that are not Jewish. They were the northern kingdom. That was conquered about 120 years before Judah, back in 721 BCE. And Judah being taken by Babylon in 586 BCE. So we have a segregation of even Israel, but you know, getting to the nuts and bolts of this, Israel simply means prevailer with the Almighty and with humanity. Now, do you want to be a prevailer, a champion with our Creator and all humanity? 
Well, there's nothing wrong with being called Israel. That's what it means. You're a champion. Okay, please don't be anti-Semitic about it and say it's just for the Jews only. Read Romans 11 a little more carefully if you believe in the New Testament. And if, even if you don't, if, you know, it's important to understand the facts of what the scriptures really do teach. Not just believe what has been taught by the majority out there, but check up on your, for yourself. So Genesis 1.14, we see these feast days foreordained, they're shared with his, his firstborn son. And then in Exodus chapter 24.22... This is Exodus, or you say Shemot in Hebrew. It says, You shall have the same law for the stranger and for whom is in your own country, for I am the Almighty. So the same law, and he says, Share these feast days. We can go to Deuteronomy 16. Read uh, Devarim 16, Deuteronomy. It says, You are to include the foreigners, the strangers, the fatherless the widows, the homeless, you know, whoever is willing to keep these feast days with you, include them. It was never to be exclusive for the Jewish people only because it offers a plan of salvation. He wants to save everybody who's willing and that includes grafting in the, Jew the Gentile people like Rahab and Ruth. You know, they... They left their Gentile identity and, and became Israel, champions with the Almighty. And so we see in Leviticus chapter 23, our Creator calls them His feast days. Important to note there, He doesn't call them Israel feast days or the Israelite feast days or your feast He says, these are mine. My days, His days, I should say. I'm speaking for Him sometimes and I... Assume you understand without getting offended. Now, however, though, when we decide to change his days or his ways, and we make his ways our ways, and don't want to follow his instructions on how to do things, and we want to just do them our own way, well, then he calls them our days, our feast days. As we read in Isaiah chapter 1, in verses 13 through 15 and you can also go to Amos chapter 5 verse 21 through 23 the Almighty says I despise your feast days your Sabbaths your appointed times your sacrifices of course when people he commanded sacrifices and Sabbaths and all these things for his will and glory but if we want to change the sacrificial system, like, for example, human sacrifice, ooh, obviously, I think we can all agree that if we start doing uh, human sacrifices, as the pagans did, well, then they're not his sacrifices. So that's just a, an extreme example of changing his ways and not following his instructions and uh, doing it our own ways or wherever we want to do it, whenever we want to do it. We uh, blend pagan polytheistic theology or practices with worshiping him. He says he doesn't like that. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 12, if you haven't noticed this before in terms of Sabbaths and holy days and feast days and holidays, we have national holidays. He says, he says in, in uh, Deuteronomy, he says, do not worship me the way the nations worship their gods. Don't copy their practices. Don't do like a monkey see, monkey do and say, okay, well, I like the way they worship those uh, false gods over there. I'm going to worship the true God in the way that they worship their gods. That's, that's a pretty cool way of glorifying, and, and of course, that's to nobody, but I'm going to do it to somebody. He says, don't do that. That... He is a jealous God, as he says, in the right kind of jealousy. He doesn't want to be blended with any other lovers or, you know, spiritually speaking, in idolatry. So let's go to, and you can read about that in Deuteronomy, chapter 12, verses 29 
through 32. And verse 32 simply says, please do not add or take away from these words. And we see that in Joshua, don't add or take away. We see it in Proverbs, don't add or take away. We see at the end of Revelation, even in the New Testament, please be careful, do not add or take away. But mankind, for some reason, likes to deviate, especially when you deviate away from his ways. It's very disappointing to him. So getting back to his feast days in Leviticus, the whole chapter is talking about his feast. Notice this in verse 1. And the Almighty spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Almighty. Again, these are his feasts which you are to proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. Again, they're not ours. They're not Jewish. They're not, they are his, okay? And so, you know, it is important to realize that and, and try to seek the truth, you know, from, from the scripture's point of view. Now, if we turn down to verse 23, it's easy to remember. Leviticus 23, 23, we have this day of Yom Teruah, this uh, feast of trumpets, as we often say in English. It says, Then the Almighty spoke to Moshe, saying, <coughs> verse 24, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the seventh month, you shall have a Shabbat rest. Now, Sabbath rest. A memorial. Notice that. A memorial. Something to remember. What is there to remember? And in, in Colossians chapter 2, we see the Apostle Shaul saying these are a shadow of things to come. So actually, they're, the primary purpose of these festivals is for a future fulfillment that has not been fulfilled. So it's kind of like a rehearsal. It's also referred like a, re a wedding rehearsal. We're going to get to this a little bit, that there will be a special future wedding appointment with when he comes back. But it's like a wedding rehearsal. You go to rehearsals. You practice. You rehearse. You learn and try to visualize the best you can what that special day will be like. Right? And so you do the best you can. So when that day comes, you're prepared. You're ready. You want to follow through and do what is right. And so it's a memorial, like an anniversary, because it comes once a year. You know, how important are our anniversaries? And, and we say birthdays are important. But what about what our Creator says is important here? The memorial blowing the trumpets, the shofars. Here we have it, a shouting of the trumpets of, of shofars, a holy convocation. That's like a like a like a a sacred assembly, or we call it a church service in today, or synagogue. Uh, however you want to word that, whatever language or culture you prefer to use. It says you shall do no customary work on it. And you shall offer up an offering made by fire to the Creator. Now this is where people say, oh, okay, say the sacrificial system was, uh, no, it, we're not doing it anymore. So that means we don't need to keep the holy day. No, that's not what it's saying here. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, You are to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. Give it up. Give up a day of your work and play. Give up a day of your work and play for Him once a year. Is that too much to ask? He's the one who's given you life and breath as I even speak right now, if you're listening. And please don't get offended. I don't mean to offend anybody. Sometimes I get a little too excited and, and uh, very inspired about the topic here. But you know, we are to give ourselves as an offering or a free will offering if you want to do as you feel in your heart. Of course, we don't have to do animal sacrifices today as, as I'm uh, recording this video message. Um, 
So let's understand that this day is important, but what significance, what importance has it for Gentiles under the New Covenant? The New Covenant. What significance, what importance has it for Gentiles? Now, first of all, let's look at what Orthodox Judaism has even understood in regard to this day, which they refer to as Rosh Hashanah. They know, and have been prophesying for centuries, I don't know how long, but the Mashiach will come on this day. It's an annual anniversary or a rehearsal. It's, uh, it's a memorial of the future the excitement of the coming of the Messiah. Not just coming, but coming in kingship. So he is coming in kingship on this day. So this isn't just made up by me or any form of Christianity or Hebrew roots or Messianic Judaism. This is, this is commonly known that the kingship of the Messiah Will, will be inaugurated on this special appointed time. And as we see way back in Genesis 1, 14, you know, from the foundations of this earth, you know, these things have been ordained and predestined to take place. A, a really good outline he has blueprints for, so to speak. Now, under the New Covenant, we know that it will be the second coming. The Messiah's second return, his second coming to this earth, will be in kingship. And we're going to get to those scriptures. But why, you know, so that's the biggest difference between uh, Judaism and, 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 the, and the proper, I guess you could say, if you want to say Christian understanding of this holy day. But you know, the Messiah... This Yeshua from Nazareth, this carpenter of the first century, many of you refer to him as Jesus, he was actually born right about this time. It says that uh, Yosef and Miriam had to go stay in a manger. Well, of course, it was a pilgrimage feast and all the, 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 the inns were, were being taken and vacancies were too hard to find even in the outskirts cities around Jerusalem as people gathered. And so they had to stay in a manger. But what's even more obvious evidence, and I hate to burst your bubble out there, if you think Jesus was born on December 25th, it's not true. And even the scriptures, if you turn to Luke chapter 2, verses 8, I think it's around verse 8 to 15, it says, The shepherds were out in the field, and they see the sign of the star in the heavens, that it was the appointed time. Well, shepherds are not out in the fields in December. Not anywhere there around Jerusalem or Bethlehem or Middle East. It's too cold in December. They, they go inside during that time. But during the fall, during the, the late spring, and even you know when the weather is warmer, of course they're out in the fields. And so all the scholars know this. Do your own credible research in history if you don't believe me. Check up on me. But, you know, our Messiah was not born on December 25th. It was somewhere either on this day of, Ra of Yom Teruah or there's a lot of evidence that it was the beginning of Sukkot, the eight-day festival. It's a little ambiguous. I don't want to get dogmatic or into that too much right now. But I thought that's an interesting parallel, that the first coming of the Messiah did happen around this time. Also, if you take the fact, if you believe that he was 33 and a half years old when he was crucified, we know he was crucified in the spring with the Passover. Well, you subtract 30 years, and then a half a year is fall. Okay, you have the fall holy days, which we are in as I'm recording this right now. We are in the midst of the fall annual holy days of our, our Creator here. So 33 and a half years makes perfect sense. You just got to do the math. That it was not anywhere near December 25th. And again, I'm sorry if that bursts your bubble, but um, the, the December 25th goes way back about 4,000 or more years, even to Nimrod and his potential birthday and and uh, uh, that's a whole other thing. Go to our 
just do a Google search for Passion for Truth Ministries or simply Truth or Tradition. Pastor Jim Staley out there in Missouri. He's got a great video teaching on the origins of Christmas and Easter. If you uh, want to be like a Berean, if you want to really know the truth, I encourage you to go out to, you know, to, to, to do a Google search or a YouTube search for truth or tradition. Which do you want to follow? The truth or tradition? Now, if traditions are truth, okay. But if traditions are not truth and it's heresy or paganism, watch out. I'm warning you, like um, like an Ezekiel 33 watchman blowing the shofar, warning the people that a sword is coming upon the land. And you have so much time, now I don't know how much time, but to repent and save yourselves. Read Ezekiel chapter 33 sometime, please, if you haven't recently. So Yeshua was born about this time of year, his second coming. Now here's some New Testament, as many of you refer to, New Covenant. We say in Hebrew, Brit Hadashah, simply means New Covenant Scriptures, where we see this in, in Matthew, or Matthew, chapter 24, verse 29. Yeshua prophesies this, Yahshua. Um, in, uh, in chapter 24, verse 20, says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, he's prophesying a great tribulation, end time one. We see this in the minor prophets of Amos and other prophets of the scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. <clears throat> the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will come, will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Notice this. How does this have anything to do with uh, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah? Well, notice this. Verse 31. And he will send his angels with the sound of a trumpet, a mighty one. So everyone on earth is going to be able to hear this. Better than our modern technology, somehow amplified, I'm sure. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to another. Wow, a mighty trumpet. Here's a clue. Here's a, here's a little hint, but let's continue. The Apostle Shaul has a lot more evidence here. If we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is also known as the resurrection chapter. Yeah, even the Pharisees believed in the resurrection during the first century. The Sadducees apparently didn't, as we see in the book of Acts. At least uh, a good uh, portion of them didn't believe in the resurrections. But the Pharisees and the scribes knew of the resurrections. Now notice this. In verse 50 of uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Notice we'll get to this, uh, what this day means here. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of our Creator. Flesh and blood, our, our human flesh cannot. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. This is a hidden truth, a secret of our Creator. We shall not all sleep, but shall be changed. So sleep is referred to death, because when we die, we go unconscious. Regardless of what uh, the majority of Christianity has taught, uh, there's metaphors and allegories we need to understand correctly. But death is simply sleep. Why would we need resurrections if, uh, if people die and they're consciously go to heaven or hell? Well, there obviously needs, and it says in Acts chapter 2, King David has not ascended to heaven. If anyone, he's a man after our Creator's own heart, hasn't been there. And only the Son of, of our Creator, he's the only one who's ascended and descended to this date, to, to this point, okay? So death is like a sleep mode, awaiting. You know, our Creator does reserve and 
our spirit somehow in an unconscious mode for waiting for the resurrections. And this is what the Apostle Shaul is referring to here. He says, uh, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, very quickly, it's quick, quicker than you can blink an eye. That's what death is like. When you're asleep, you're just unconscious. A thousand years can be like quicker than blinking your eye. Like a nanosecond, a billionth of a second. He says, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. Here we have a, a, the last trumpet. There's also other trumpets here we'll read about in Revelation. But the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For the corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal body, our mortal bodies must put on immortality. So this is talking about an, a futuristic day of trumpet, a blowing of a, of a shofar that's going to awaken this earth like it's never been awakened and a resurrection like there's never been before. And he also uh, points this out in, in 1 Thessalonians. If you want to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 13 through 18, it says, again, he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. You know, okay, these are people who have died, our loved ones, it's very sad. People who have no hope, it's even a lot more sad and disappointing and depressing. But he says, lest your sorrow as others who don't have this faith and hope, who others who have no hope. For if we believe that this Yeshua, you may say Jesus, died and rose again, even so the Almighty, the Creator, the Father, will bring him, Yeshua, those who sleep in Yeshua, in the Messiah, in his body, those who are in, his, in the body, so to speak, that are sleeping, that are dead. For we, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming, and if you're still alive when he returns on this special annual holy date, will by no means precede those who are asleep. So we're not going to get to uh, the Messiah quicker than those who have already died. Okay, The dead will rise first and meet the Messiah first before those who are alive when he returns. And that's what he's saying. He says, For the Lord, Adonai, the Master himself, will descend from heaven with a shout. Here we have Yom Teruah. Teruah means shouting. With a shout. Not just with voices, but with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of the Almighty. So the Almighty has a mighty trumpet, much mightier than what I have here or any of us out here have, that is mighty. And the angel is going to be allowed to borrow that trumpet, so to speak, utilize it. And he says here, And the dead in the Messiah will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet him in the air. Now this is post-tribulation. There's no pre-trib rapture, okay? That's another Christian created doctrine out there. No pre, not before the seven years or beginning of the seven years. There's an exodus. We can see it's another whole teaching, you know, three and a half years before this appointed time, but it's not to heaven. It's to a, a place on earth of safety and protection. Another topic. Don't want to get there now, but you can go there if you want to see my video teachings on hot, cold, lukewarm, or also be counted worthy. You know, search for that on my YouTube teachings, or go to my ministry website, TorahTruthSeekers.org. That's O-R-G. Anyway, he said, meet him in the air. We shall always be with him at this point. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. It's comforting. It's rejoicing. It's exciting to know that, you know, eternal life. No longer our physical bodies uh, that are deteriorating, that have a lot of physical problems compared to what it will be like in the future. Now we also go, let's go to Revelation here. We see also 
the trumpets here, Yom Teruah. Revelation 11, and this is in verses 15 through 19. Verses 15 through 19, it says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there was a loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Messiah. Notice, the kingdoms of our Creator, our Father, and His Mashiach which is also our Mashiach, of course, our Messiah. And he shall reign forever and ever. This is the kingship. This is the prophecy that even the Jewish Orthodox people have known for centuries. The kingship of the Messiah will be inaugurated on this special appointed time. Now, if you're invited to a special appointed time, say a wedding, do you want to be there at the right time? Or on your own time. Uh, what's the difference a day, day uh, late, or not fully dressed properly, or appropriately? Well, sounds silly, doesn't it? Yeah, of course. But uh, we need to understand that this coming of kingship is the Messiah's second coming to this earth. Just like the prophets, all the prophets had to endure humility and training with humility. You go back to Noah, had to build this ark for 120 years. Wow, why didn't you say, well, you're a much builder than me, Almighty. Why don't you, you could build it so much faster. 120 years of humble building and patience he had to have. Building patience as a servant. Servant. Learning the, the way and the life of a servant before glory and exaltation or fulfillment of the calling. And look at, uh, you know, not just Noah, we can see Abraham, you know, had to live in, in his relatives and he was a humble man, meek man. Moses, you know, was, had to go into the, into the field to be a shepherd for hundred. 40 years and then he had to take the people out and so we see uh, Joseph Joseph you know, had to go in prison even for a number of years falsely accused uh, you see the suffering servant in Joseph you see the suffering servant in King David you see uh, who was a man after his own heart being pursued and hunted down like an animal for a number of years and not until he was 30 was he exalted the kingship and, and Joseph the same way. You see the suffering servants before royalty and kingship and calling. Uh, Daniel, and we, we see Mordecai in the story of Esther. I mean, if you're Orthodox Jew out there and you're still listening to this, I thank you. I thank you for not getting offended. But please reconsider the fact that the Mashiach must also be a suffering servant. Isaiah 53. He has to die for the sins of the people at the appointed time of the Passover. That's the first coming. Yom Kippur has to do with his second coming. Making atonement with his second coming. But his first coming has been fulfilled as the suffering servant who fulfilled Isaiah 53. We see Zechariah, you know, we will look upon him whom we have pierced. Is that uh, chapter 10 or 12 or verses 10 and 12? We see in Psalms 22 the piercing of the hands and the feet. You know, these things are prophesied, not just, you know, I know many of you see it as the whole people of Israel there and it could be applied in that way, interpreted that way. But not when we look at the whole package and the picture here. I have a video teaching on Yom Kippur, the Talmud. Yom Kippur and Yeshua. You know, it's in your own Talmud. You know, plenty of evidence that this Yeshua, this Jew from Nazareth in the first century who died at 30 CE, you know, common era, or in that time period, is in your Talmud. Even 40 years of rejecting the Yom Kippur sacrifice. 40 years in a row. 
So anyway, uh, let me get back to my topic here. Um, getting back to Revelation, this kingship, that's where I was. And the 24 elders who sat before the Almighty on their thrones fell at their faces and worshipped. Wow, you know, it says uh, there goes lightnings and noises and thunders and earth, you know, great noises and shouting. You know, there's, it's a time, of, this is a day of shouting. But a rejoicing of what it'll come. And there's difficult times beforehand, I know. Hard times. But they are what we need to truly accept the good times and appreciate these future good times that are coming. That are important for the physical body. Physical body of... of of the Messiah, of, of our Creator also. As uh, the Apostle Shaul, let me just clearly conclude here in, in Colossians chapter 2. You can see there in Colossians 2 that he's writing to physically uncircumcised people. Okay, they were, Colossae was a Gentile region. Uh, according to the context, there were no Jewish converts here. And so the Gentile world was judging them. What? You're keeping these Jewish feast days? What? You're a Gentile. You're not supposed to be keeping these things. Well, that's what Paul was saying. Don't let anybody, any man, any, and I think that includes women, you know, often in languages, I know the Hebrew, there's no neutral gender. Usually the masculine is chosen when it's referring to men and women. Uh, Spanish is the same way. In English, we have a lot of neutral words. We can say everybody. Don't let anybody judge you on these things. But, verse 17, he says, but the substance of the Messiah, he is going to judge you. So he says here in verses 16 and 17, let no one judge you. Nobody judge you in food or in drink or in regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Messiah. So the substance of Messiah is to judge you. And he says they are a shadow of things to come. What does that mean to be a shadow? Okay, what is a shadow? Well, a shadow is an outline that's a darkened visualization of not the real thing, but of the real thing. So you have a real object, but a shadow is not really the real thing, but it's an outline. You can see uh, vaguely what it looks like, what it's really like, get an idea, a, a picture in a limited point of view looking through like, a, uh, like a, a dark glass, so to speak, of the image, of the, of the real object. But it takes light on the object just to see the shadow. You can't see the shadow without the light. So you need the light. And if ever you're going to get to that real object, how these feast days are a shadow of things to come, you need the light be shine upon you, the revelation, the truth. And then you can see these shadows where we are keeping these rehearsals, these anniversaries, so to speak, in advance of a future, you know, ultimate, awesome, glorious fulfillment. And so that's what he's saying here. Don't let anybody judge you, no man, but only the body of Messiah. Now, well, you might say, well, the body of Messiah is my church. Okay, I'll let them judge me. Now, the, the typical Protestant point of view is you can do what's right in your own eyes here. Don't let anybody judge you. You can keep any day. Or what about the body? Okay, well, what about my church? Okay, I'll let them judge you. Well, there's so many factions and divisions and sects and and thousands of denominations, Christian, I'm just talking about Christianity, also in Judaism and in every religion. So should we let the body today be a higher authority than what we can see in the body of the first century? 
which we have the records here in the Holy Scriptures. You know, 1 Corinthians 5, right there, I think it's verse 8, the Apostle says, Let us keep these feasts. He doesn't say, the, and he's talking to the Gentile Colossians, keeping the Jewish, as they call it, but they're the Creator's feast. And he refers right to the days of unleavened bread, putting leavening out of your homes. Put out the physical leaven and the spiritual leaven. The spiritual leavening is even more important, of course. So we see that. I believe that's 1 Corinthians 5, and this is off my memory. So let me just do a double quick check here. In case any of you want to check up on me, I'm going to check up on myself real quick. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 5, verses, verse 8. Read it for yourself. We are to keep these feasts. Seven annual ones. And the physical body of the Messiah. His example of the Messiah. He kept them. We see through the book of Acts, the apostles, all of them kept them, including the one you can call Paul. His Hebrew name Shaul. So, we shouldn't be just doing what's right in our own eyes or our own opinion, right? I hope we can uh, agree upon that. And if you don't, please don't get offended. There's no need to attack or persecute or do anything against me. You know, Messiah says to love our enemies. If I'm your enemy, you know, because I give you what I believe is the truth, please... Don't hate me and persecute me. you got to love me anyway. If you want to be a true follower of the Messiah. Nowhere are we told to persecute, to torture, to murder people who disagree with our theological point of view. Well, yeah, there's scriptures that say to avoid people who are proselyting you with false doctrine. And avoid, but not to excommunicate and persecute and aggressively, offensively attack people who disagree. But getting back to my conclusion here, as our Messiah, Yeshua, quotes Psalms 118 verse 26, where it says in Psalms 118 verse uh, 26 is Baruch, 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 Habab, Bashem, Adonai. Or if you want his holy name in the letters, yud heh vav -Hey, can be pronounced Yahweh or Yehovah. Please don't get offended. But Baruch Habab Bashem Yehovah, Yahweh. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, notice this. Now, let's go to Mattyahu. Chapter 23, where he quotes that scripture. The Jewish people are going to be saying this in Jerusalem on this appointed time, Yom Teruah, as he also prophesies here. Here he says, Oh, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, the one who kills the prophets, verse 37 of Matthew, chapter 23. You who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Now, of course, most of the prophets were martyred by the Israeli leaders of those times that were not righteous. It's not just the Romans who killed the Jewish people, the faithful prophets, okay? So it's not just the Christians, the Christian crusaders. Now, for centuries, the Christians have been trying to kill off the Jewish people and even those whom they titled as Judaizers. But they've been unsuccessful. The gates of hell have not prevailed against us. And so the, the faithful ones are pr often persecuted by his own people who have gone astray. And this is what he's saying. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Now, these, uh, don't, please don't take this personally. 
unless the shoe fits, of course, but I'm assuming if you're still listening, you are not doing this to our Creator or, or the Messiah, but this is talking to rebellious people who've gone astray, his chosen people who've gone astray. See, your house is left to you desolate, verse 38. For I say to you, you shall see me, this is Messiah speaking in the flesh before the resurrection, you shall see me no more till you say, Baruch, Habab, Bashem, Adonai, or Yahweh, or Yehovah. If his holy name is revealed to you, there's plenty of scriptures that say you'll be blessed by calling upon his name. Okay, not to take his name in vain, that's the third of the Ten Commandments, or to, to misuse his name or misrepresent his name by not living up to it as you should be. If you call yourself a Christian or, or a Hebrew or a, a follower of the Almighty or Creator, you're misusing his name if you're not living up to your calling. So, we're not to be doing that. I, I try to just use his name in a righteous way and not to allow any man anyone to judge me don't let anybody judge you because when it really comes down to it you are being watched you are being judged by him he is judging you